Hi guys. Well, this is a lovely, exciting Saturday night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this lovely fall evening. Man, now that the Airbnb rush has finally died down, I think I could finally get around to my hopium roundup of the week. I need to pour a margarita for this for this one, especially the opening story. It is Saturday night, October 9th, 2021, and since I no longer have a life, I'm going to sit here and talk to my imaginary friends on YouTube, and we're going to do our weekly hopium greenwashing whatever roundup where I pick out six stories and uh, I, I can't remember who the alert uh, listener was who sent me this story from good old New York Magazine right here in the great state of New York. Uh, some division of New York Magazine called The Cut. And we're going to hear from uh, California writer Emily Holloman with her essay in New York Magazine. Giving birth in the end times, writer Emily Holloman stares down the apocalypse and into the terrifying optimism of motherhood. Yes, the terrifying optimism of motherhood. This is some book length, uh, some book length. This is, guys, it's really hard to take. I, I'm just going to, uh, I, I'm going to uh, give you, oh, oh man, maybe I can make it through about five paragraphs. So this is in the middle. Explain this to us. The terrifying optimism of motherhood. <clears throat> the decision to have children has always struck me as an essentially selfish one. Wow. You choose out of a desire for fulfillment or self-betterment or curiosity or boredom or baby mania or peer pressure to bring a new human into this world. And it has never seemed more selfish than today. From a global perspective, having a child in a developed nation is among the most environmentally unsound decisions you can make. No, it is the number one. Hands down, no second place anywhere in sight. The number one bad decision you can make, uh, bar none. Uh, a baby born in the United States adds another 58.6 tons of carbon to the atmosphere per year. That wipes out the net positives of my 25 years, my 25 years of veganism in roughly three months. Thank you for that one. On the individual level, as fires rage and hurricanes form, as water grows scarce and fields lie fallow, it's hard to wonder, what kind of future can we offer a child? And yet, period, I love that, and yet, on some level, we still believe that a baby our baby will bring the world, our world, so much more than his carbon footprint. Yeah, it'll bring uh, 50 years of shit. It, it'll bring, uh, yeah, yeah not, not even get me going. Yes, <laughs> it'll bring so much more than his carbon footprint. On another, we believe, like so many before us, that a baby can be the only balm 
balm after a loss. She was talking about how her depressed sister committed suicide right before she had a baby. Or obviously, her sister was thinking about being an auntie and blew her brains out. That it will transform me from being a bereaved sister to something new and alien. A mother. Yes. New and alien. So her sister blows her brains out or somehow committed suicide after she woke up and smelled the coffee while her kid sister was getting ready to have an alien baby. Anyway, guys, this goes on for pages. We're going to get down. That's just right. We're going to get down to the bottom. I got five more stories, although uh, you're going to be uh, so nauseated by the end of this. Okay. So her new bundle of joy's name is Jude. Hey, Jude. I know that the world in which Jude grows up in will be plagued by more and more environmental disasters. That cataclysmic changes to the climate will exacerbate the other inequities we face as a nation and as a planet. That we are living in a real way on borrowed time under the shadow of carbon that's already been released as more fossil fuel continues to burn and burn and burn. Although that future still terrifies me, and part of me wants to just disengage, to say, let it burn, and fuck you to all that, I can't. I don't have that luxury. I have no choice but to believe that the future, troubled as it will be, stripped as it will be, of my brilliant sister is still worth living in and fighting for to believe not just in destruction, not just in accruing loss after loss after loss, but in counting my blessings, yes, finding those small moments of joy. Yes, these small moments of joy. This smile on Jude's face as he bashes his mouth into my cheek. Boop, I say, and, and I tap his nose. Boop, boop, boop. <sighs> boop, I, boop, I say as I tap his nose. The same sound my sister used to make when I tapped hers. This isn't the ending that I'm looking for, and it isn't just an ending either. It's a beginning, too, an often frightening one, and one, for now, that has to be good enough. And guys, it's really tough for me to go on after that. I have to, I have to admit, uh, that one was, was, was a mouthful. But anyway, we're going to plow on. Uh, we're going to go from that to NASA. NASA's Armageddon-style asteroid, <laughs> asteroid deflection mission takes off in November. Yes. All right. <clears throat> NASA has a launch date for that most Hollywood of missions, the double asteroid redirection test, which is basically a dry run of the movie Armageddon. Unlike the film, however, this will not involve nukes, oil rigs, or Aerosmith, but instead is a practical test of our ability to change the trajectory of an asteroid in a significant and predictable way. Yes, this is the DART mission. Should be called the cue ball mission. The DART mission, managed by the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, 
involves sending a pair of satellites out to a relatively nearby pair of asteroids known as the Didymos binary. It is one largish as asteroid, approximately seven, eight hundred meter meters across and a 160 meter moonlit. Yes. Uh, so we will be testing the possibility of intercepting an asteroid by smashing into it at nearly 15,000 miles an hour. So I I anyway, guys, so let, let me get this straight, uh, what they're talking about. So we got these two asteroids relatively near planet Earth, causing no threat to planet Earth. So we're going to test the cue ball theory. And I know Graham Hancock is a big proponent of asteroid deflection. So what we're going to do next month is we're going to fire off these two rockets to change the direction of two asteroids that at the present time are posing no threat to planet Earth. I can't imagine how this could go wrong, but you know, I've always said about asteroids that there's, you know, there's no chance that global industrial civilization is going to be brought down by an asteroid, but uh, I do wish NASA luck in redirecting the path of an otherwise, uh, you know, safe asteroid to bring down global industrial civilization next month. All right, back here on our own planet, what is going on in the wildfire fighting technology? New fire retardant could be a game changer in fighting wildfires. Yes. U.S. officials on Tuesday approved a long-lasting fire retardant that could significantly aid in fighting increasingly destructive wildfires by stopping them before they even start. Yes. The U.S. Forest Service has approved Perimeter Solutions fire retardant that is intended to be used as a wildfire preventative measure that can last for months. It is similar to the company's red dyed retardant dropped from aircraft while fighting active wildfires, but it is clear and sprayed by ground-based workers. So they, they actually just hose down the trees when there's no wildfire even threatening the trees. Okay, this is Edward Goldberg, chief CEO of Perimeter Solutions. The real game changer here is once you treat it, you can forget it. It's there for the whole year. All right, let's wish them luck. Let's just go hose down the National Forest with a fire retardant. Okay, here we go again. Uh, all right, where have we heard this one before? This carbon-free energy source could be the wave of the future if only Americans wouldn't freak out about it. Yeah, nuclear energy ticks all the boxes, but Americans are still ambivalent about it. And this is just the latest, uh, you know, uh, little uh, cheerleading for more nuclear energy. This is from Market Watch. Um, Let's see, uh, 
We have only had one major problem with nuclear power in this country, a partial meltdown of a reactor at Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island plant back in 1979. Come on, America. Yes. And it was frightening enough to turn public sentiment against nuclear power. And even today, more than four decades later, Americans remain ambivalent about it. Yes. Public perception about nuclear power has also been influenced by other accidents, notably Chernobyl in the Soviet Union and more recently the Fukushima disaster in Japan where an undersea earthquake in the Pacific caused a tsunami. Yes, these are legitimate scares, but the reaction to them has caused new problems. Yes, I bet. Uh, anyway, guys, let's see. Perhaps the United States has overreacted to nuclear scares. Perhaps, yes. Uh, Let's see, uh, among states pulling the plug on nuclear power is California where they're moving ahead with plans to shutter the state's last two operating <coughs> reactors uh, at the Diablo Canyon plant midway between LA and San Francisco. Diablo sits near several earthquake fault lines. Cracks in the Earth's crust that are potential locations for earthquakes. That sounds like a good reason to shut it down. Hmm. A nuclear power plant on an earthquake fault. Yet, this practical matter remains. The plant's reactors generate tons of power. Yes! There you go. So there you go. Fears of nuclear accidents are justified, though technology and safety procedures may be, may be far better today. Nuclear reactors can now be built, proponents claim, with technical advancements to prevent a repeat of those past accidents. One savvy technologist, one savvy technologist named Bill Gates founded Terra Power in 2008 out of this belief. The federal government's advanced reactor demonstration program recently selected Gates Company to prove it can build a better nuclear reactor. Yes, the privately held company owned by Bill Gates responded by vowing to build a, quote, fully functional advanced nuclear reactor within seven years. You go for it, Uncle Billy. All right. But we're going to go from Bill Gates to Dow Chemical. Dow CFO on plans for zero carbon growth. Okay, this is a fellow named, this is Dow President and CFO Howard Ungerleiter. Yeah, so what does Howard have to say about how Dow Chemical will soon be saving the planet along with Bill Gates' new improved nuclear power plant? Okay, if I can get a Bill Gates' computer to work here. I hope Bill Gates' nuclear power plant works better than his computers. Okay, we're just going to... Okay. This is how Dow Chemical uh, So this is the the interviewer talk to me. How does it work? And otherwise, how do you 
make a chemical plant, you guys, as you said, are going to be making ethylene there. How does that get to zero carbon emissions? All right, this is how Dow, this is in Alberta, Canada. My guess has something to do with the tar sands, although you're never going to read the words tar sands. This is a guess. Okay. This is Howard Ungerleiter on how Dow Chemical is going to save the planet. All right. We're doing it primarily with an autothermal reformer and carbon capture. So basically, we have got an existing hydrocarbon cracker on the site today. Yes. <clears throat> we will be building a brand new world scale cracker at that site as well. So it's a brownfield investment. And then connected to the cracker, we will put an autothermal reformer. What that autothermal reformer does is it takes off gas or waste gas from both crackers and turns it into hydrogen. And then that hydrogen will go back into the process and we'll close the loop. And then we will also join the Alberta trunk line. Carbon capture has been a capability in Alberta for quite a while. So we'll take carbon capture and capture any of the carbon and then sequester and store the carbon. So that will allow us to get probably 95% of the carbon off the site. And then we'll do the rest, I don't know, either with alternative energy and or some offsets to close the gap from 95% to 100% to really make it a net zero emission site in the first ever net zero emission site in the world. <sighs> and then uh, the interviewer says, Howard, two of your larger investors are in fact Vanguard and BlackRock. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes on from there. I wish I I, I uh, don't want to copyright it. I, I'm sorry. I I should have called it up. Someone sent me this video from Australia. It really is hilarious. Uh, from Australia taking this crap, this total unadulterated horseshit, and and mocking it, uh, and, and you know, and translating. What this, what this gobbledygook means, you know, reading between the lines of this crap. You know, these guys, this, this dude, he's probably making, he's the CFO of Dow Chemical Corporation. Uh, spewing this crap makes me want to puke. Anyway. What do we got? One more. Let's do one more. Now this one, guys, uh, I mean, I'm throwing it in here and you can decide. Uh, now this one is, uh, th th I, I wish I could make a joke about this, but I do believe this one. Okay. I do believe this one and uh, you, you can decide. Uh, why I added this one to wrap up today's hopium. UN endorses world's first malaria vaccine as, quote, historic moment. Yes, you know, the, the United Nations and its uh, sustainable development goals and all of that. The World Health Organization on Wednesday endorsed the world's first malaria vaccine and said it should be given to children across Africa in the hope that it will spur stalled efforts to curb the spread of the parasitic disease. Yes, this is WHO Director General Tedros Gebel. Quote, today's recommendation offers a glimmer of hope for the continent of Africa, which shoulders the heaviest burden of the disease 
and we expect many more African children to be protected from malaria and grow into healthy adults. You kind of need to be healthy to uh, get on a, uh, you know, on one of those inflatable boats and make it across the Mediterranean Ocean uh, or, or hanging uh, out of the bottom of the, uh, the landing gear uh, in, a, uh, in an airplane uh, headed from uh, Ghana to London. But anyway, I need to remember what channel I'm on. Uh, that, that's what we need, guys. You know, malaria, the, the, the reason malaria exists on this planet, okay, is to, it is a system of checks and balances. Uh, malaria uh, kills more children in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, than any other disease, but we got that vaccine on its way and we're gonna have more and more of those African children that Bill Gates has already uh, saved from all his other vaccines. So you can look forward, I guess, instead of, uh, the population of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, instead of rising from 1 billion to 4 billion this century, maybe we can, let's see if we can get 8 billion uh, people in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 21st century. And, and this is the one out of here that's actually going to work. Yes. Anyway, I'm working myself up into a lather. I'm going to wrap up this little hopium. All right, now this little dog, are you glad to wrap this up? You say, Bob, there's too much hopium going on on this table. No. We might have to come back. Get out there and suck down all the hopium you can while you still can. Bye, guys.